Hey people, how are you doing? Welcome to the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Um, it is recorded live on YouTube, uh, just in case you listen to the podcast. And thank you very much, first of all. Thanks for downloading and listening to it. Hope you do enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, then do please leave us a rating on the Sports Therapy Association podcast, whether you're on Apple Podcasts or on a, whatever app you like, just leave a rating for it, a review, and that helps us get the good word out to more people. That's what it's all about. Uh, but yeah, we do record it live. So if you want to join us live, then just go along to the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel at eight o'clock any Tuesday. Uh, that's what we've done for the last 127 weeks. This is week 128, which is great. Um, and thank you to everybody who does send in comments and appreciation. And yeah, we love it. And of course, thank you to people who join us live. We're now coming into the live lounge. Um, and let's have a look. Becky Carroll is here. When you do come in the live lounge, and I can bring your question or comment or just a high up into the screen. For example, Becky Carroll is first through the door with a beautiful hat in her portrait, saying, Good evening, all. Looking forward to tonight's episode. Me too, Becky. Me too. Uh, Becky, you were one of the people who came dancing, pirouetting out of uh, Tristan Attenborough's um, presentation at Therapy Expo. I'm delighted by it, you were. So, looking forward to some good questions from you tonight, Becky. Glenn Murphy's in the house as well. Hey, Glenn, how are you doing? Says, Good evening, all. Brian Huxley is here as well, saying hi, everyone. Hoping you're all well. We're all great, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Um, I do. We do love you joining us live. Um, I've always, with whether it's Run Chat Live or Sports Therapy Association podcast, I've always done it live, even if there's kind of not that many people in it. I just think it makes for good listening because there's no editing. It puts our guests on the spot, not to stress just an hour or anything, but I will not be editing this at all. Pressure. I love it. I can see beads of sweat running down his forehead now. But um, yeah, it is live. And if you want to join us, like I say, 8 o'clock, Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel. Right, before we do bring up Tristan for tonight's episode, just a thanks to everyone who joined us last week on the show. Um, although normally we do the Have Your Say the first Tuesday of the month, we decided to do it last week because it was the week after Therapy Expo. Um, and it just seemed to make sense. And um, we had um, STA regional reps and STA members on the show. Um, to chat about Therapy Expo, to kind of not put it to bed, but just to kind of chat about it, absorb it, reflect a little bit. It was a great show. So Gary Benson, the founder, was on it. Also Catherine Reimer, who's the SDA Regional Rep for Leeds in West Yorkshire. Leslie Campbell um, from Lennox Town, Scotland, was with us. Stevie Barr um, was live from Glasgow. Had a fantastic internet connection as well. Um, respect to Glasgow. Simon Webster joined us for the first time. Sports therapist and fitness coach from Bournemouth. Ryan Smith. STA Regional Rep for the East of England, the co-host of Let's Be Frank podcast with Wizards, with us, and Dr. Fiona Hicks, uh, Director of Move Our Learning and co-host, of course, of Women's Sports Therapy podcast, WIST for short, was with us as well. Great episode. Obviously, it's there. You can watch um, it on YouTube. I'm just bringing these up on the screen for those of you who are visually excited. So, yeah, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, Raising Standards, which is what we do, then all the episodes are there. And also, just in case you didn't realise, then there is a little chance, for example, this was taken about an hour ago or so. Um, whenever I book the, the new live video on, there's a chance to click a button to get a reminder, which is useful for some of you busy people. Uh, just click on it and you'll get a reminder saying this is about to start in 10 minutes or something. So you can go to YouTube to watch the video. If you prefer the audio, you can go to any podcast um, app. Um, on iPhone, you've normally got an innate app. If you're on Android, you can download something like Pocket Casts or Acast or something, or there's loads of them. Um, and obviously, also, you can go to the sta.co.uk, um, which is the uh, website, and you can either listen to the podcast there or you can watch the video and you look at the show notes and everything. So, loads of choices for you. But with that all said and done, yes. Tristan Attenborough, um, Therapy Expo, just to bring it up again, even though I said we're putting it to bed, it was a great show. A record number of speakers and presentations this year. Some would say too many. Some would say we were a sport for choice and more interested in trying to get to the next one rather than digesting what we just heard. But one name, one name surfaced over all of the others, and that was the guest we have on tonight, Tristan Attenborough. Honestly, loads of, the, in such a pool of speakers, for that name to appear so many times um, from people who are saying to me, wow, I've just been to see Tristan. Um, so I'm so happy that we've got the man himself here to chat us through his presentation and what he was hoping to get from it. Um, and um, I did want to go and see it. And I'm glad that I told him before and didn't just make it up that I'm, I'm coming to see yours at 12 o'clock in Theatre B, I think it was. But I was in another theatre. I had to go and present in a, another theatre, the Gate Analysis course. So I missed it because of a very good reason. So I'm really excited about the man himself. So, as always, people are joining us live. Catherine just come to the door as well. Hey, Catherine Reimer. If you've got questions, then here's your chance, okay, to grill the man himself. 
But I think that's all the housekeeping done. So without further ado, I should bring up the man of the hour, Tris Attenborough. Hey, Tris, how you doing? Good evening. It's very lovely to be here. I've called you Tris before. It feels a bit intimate. Um, no, Tris is, people... Tris is my preferred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, I did have a bit of a nightmare changing all my Tristans from A N to E N after I realised that I'd spelt it wrong. You're probably used to that. Appreciate um, that. Yeah, make sure you say thank you to whoever decided to spell it with an E. That's really that didn't cost me any time at all. But hey, <laughs> great for coming, mate. Thank you so much. Really good to see you. Um, were you surprised, first of all, about the feedback you've had from? The yes, I. Well, I was surprised anyone came. That was the first <laughs> That's thing. That's a good start. Genuinely, because. I, I kind of—I mean, I know a few people had said, "Oh, you know, I'd like to hear what you're going to sort of bang on about," but because I called mine, in my experience, the world is more or less flat, and then I saw everyone else's uh, titles and thought, "I don't know if I would go to that." <laughs> so I, I didn't know. I just—I just had no idea. It, it, it sort of makes sense to me in my head, but I wasn't sure if it would um, draw anybody in. So that some people turned up was delightful. Um, and and it was absolutely lovely. <laughs> one of the things I love about you, and it's, it's common to all of my guests, is you are, and I think we're going to see tonight, you are wonderfully modest in real life. You generally were quite anxious and not quite sure how it's going to go, weren't you? No. No, I am... Um, um, yeah, I, th I probably tend not to believe too readily that people actually like me or <laughs> appreciate what I say, but that's personal stuff that I'm working through <laughs> the last couple of decades. So, yes, so, yes it's, it's absolutely lovely if, if anyone likes anything <laughs> that, that I might come out with. That's wicked. It's really exciting. And I think, you know what, I think it summed up nice, the fact that it was well-received, summed up how far maybe we always kind of go on about oh things aren't changing it takes like 13 years for the research to reach the clinical floor but the fact that you were able to go to therapy expo probably the biggest convention for soft tissue therapists and give a presentation on on cognitive psychology and and all these sort of things must show that therapists are on board and are kind of thinking wow maybe it's not all to do with just my hands I mean, mm. that's very exciting I think that's respect to all the people who've been trying to kind of change the way we think and process things. So I think it's a good thing. Yes. I mean, I, I'm sort of coming from a, I mean, about 12, 15 years ago, I, I had a crack at a PhD in cognitive psychology. I didn't finish it. So that's nothing really, but I did, <laughs> I did enjoy it and I did teach a lot. Um, So rather than, obviously we, we have a huge, uh, there's this big psychological component to any therapy, no question. I'm, I'm not as uh, versed in that. Um, I'm not um, uh, sort of clinically trained uh, in, in the psychology sense. Um, or and I, and I can't, um, I'm not a counsellor or, or that. But uh, more, I was doing research in perception and you know, I've done things to do with you know, memory and how we think, things like that. I think that can tell us an awful lot um, more about ourselves and what we think is reality and not reality and, and, and so on. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's just something I find interesting. Uh, and I think it can help us. I think really just think it, it, we can bring this in and, and do something with it. The beautiful thing is you, you are a massage therapist as well. And that's mm. kind of like the joining of two worlds, which normally probably don't Never spend meet. much time with each other. And it's like always, it's like we always kind of think of the great names like Dr. Claire Minchin and people, they're, they're the ones that are the researchers, the academics are actually on the shop floor as well. And often mm. it doesn't happen. They're kind of like different makeups and different personalities. But you are somebody who knows all of this stuff. You've got your master's, you're so mm. interested in it, and yet you also enjoy massage therapy. So Very much so, yes. I am... Um, always been comfortable saying massage therapist and I, I, I think there was a huge drive because I kind of like to say that I'm not a advanced clinical professional soft tissue something 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 I, I was a massage therapist although I, one thing I have thought about this is there's an asymmetry there that's easier to do if you're a bloke mm. because I don't have the kind of problems that women massage therapists have because they get uh awful requests and messages that generally we don't come across so i do actually see a need 
for a different name. That was something I only recently kind of put together and I thought, hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a privilege to acknowledge, actually, isn't it, really? You know, when you, it's, it's easy for me. Uh, it's very true. So, right, well, we're going to get into the crutch of it. I'm just more people coming in. Gary Benson just come through the door. I've already said oh. that if you've got any questions directly for um, Tris, then just fire away. Gary Benson says, evening, apologies for being late. Just finished the call. Of course you're Gary. You spent your life on the phone. Which is um, killing time till he got here. <laughs> right, so I've what I've done is I've brought some slides along to help us um, kind of visually see what was going on in the presentation obviously even the podcast and you can't see the slides so for this this is another episode where i recommend if you listen to the podcast and you're enjoying it you might want to go along to youtube um if you can and watch it in bed under the sheet so you're not disturbing your partner or something um and get the visual input as well and also you'll get to see tristan his full glory he's got a lovely kept well kept goatee and stuff with fantastic shirt as well so it's worth getting the visual input for all of this <laughs> taste you know get all your sensory stimuli kind of working hard but um before we do bring up the slides did you have like did you kind of think with your presentation right what do i want to achieve with this what am i hoping that my people who my people people who come to see me walk out with and if so what was yeah it? very much so i i quite at the last minute i stripped out a fair bit of the science in this because i thought actually I just want to make this as understandable as possible because it's the kind of it's the kind of thing I come up against, particularly in social media. And you think there's a little bit to explain here. I never really get the chance. So how would I explain this such that everyone gets what I'm talking about and takes it on and and can could go away and, and mull it over? I mean, that was uh, and I've got very, very drawn towards how do we communicate science better we don't need more science at the moment i think we need better communication of it because i think we've lost a few on the way well covid <laughs> highlighted that at a societal level and it was a bit of a shocker um and actually it it, it dovetailed really nicely with matt scarsbrook's talk which he did the day before mine where he was saying what's evidence-based practice and and openly said how would i explain it if i'm a five-year-old he took that approach just to make it just so straightforward um and mine's just the other side of that mine carries on from his actually which was fortuitous yes so that's the short answer i want to make there this as simple and accessible as possible and you wanted the therapist to walk out with what kind of questions? What would you want them to question themselves? Or what did you want them to kind of linger in their mind for the rest of the day or maybe when they went back at the clinic on Monday? Uh, yes, is to just have a review on what we know, how sure we are we know it, mm -hmm. um, and take on some of the things which I can sort of walk through that will skew that. And it will skew it reliably as well. We, we, these are these are uh, preordained mistakes that we're destined to make simply because we're people. It's not a therapy therapy problem. It's a peopley problem. And when we understand them and take them on, it's all right. It's okay. It's okay. We can embrace like it. That. We can embrace it. I think it. that's really nice. I think that's something that's lost in social media. I think, mm. um, and, I th and we've talked about this before. I think. A year ago at Therapy Expo, if I remember rightly, we were talking about kind of like coming across on social media as a bit aggressive and kind of tribal like. And then you said, Yes, yes, tribes. And it was kind of, it was like within those 10 minutes, it's like, Wow, this is really a conversation. Yeah, for hours. I remember. But I think what I've learned, and I'm glad because I'm really sensitive to social media. And I am, um, um, yeah. And it just kind of like does my brain in a bit. And we were, we were commenting the other night when we weren't going into it, but there was a massive long thread on um, the kind of effects of paying you yes. science education stuff and the negatives and again some people have jumped in saying oh Laura Mosley is an absolute I'll beep out the word but enter whatever you like and it's all wrong and it's done damage and everyone's suffering it should never be given to any patient and a few mm. people are doing that and it's like whoa 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 hold on unfortunately we've got other people not many but who step in the middle and they're great minds they managed to get in there like Bonnie Lennox and that and oh that. Yeah. amazing isn't it let's have a ah oh, for Bonnie Lennox not in the, that sort of way but just a wow what a great mind and so She's fabulous really great. fabulous yeah, really good. um if you guys are interested too that little chat then I'll put a link in the show notes but yeah it's it's so nice when we get more time than social media I think that's why people 
fell for you because mm. they had the pleasure of being in your company face to face for that length of time and it was so much easier for you to get your message out there without people thinking oh you're just having a dig you're just having a go you're slagging off everything i do because we all read into 100 a... and whatever how many characters is and we all take it personally we all read it the wrong way we all kind of get our confirmation most certainly it's very tricky yeah, yeah so it's a lovely yeah. opportunity to hear from you um and looking through these slides as well it's lovely so anyway so you called it in my experience the world um oh dear is that a typo the world oh, is more oh. or less flat <laughs> uh do you know what i've said you an old version the, an old version that's okay it's, it's fine i'm sure that didn't get up today i don't want uh, that yeah. forget about that so yeah the world is more or less flat so for those who are thinking about it it's obviously about what you assume it was about you know in your experience by not looking further anecdotal evidence that sort of stuff i think a few people went to see to see you realize that yeah. You're on, yeah well it, i mean assuming we don't have a flat earth i don't think this is a the sort of crowd we would draw uh flat earthers uh, we're all happy that the world's a ball we've got no problem with that but we we've, we've had to learn that from beyond our own senses you know we, we can't we can't ever see that it's round you go in a plane um but in fact i have actually stood atop kilimanjaro and i have seen a curvature <laughs> but i've not seen the whole thing as a ball but i'm perfectly happy that it's a ball so i've decided to not rely on my own experience mm -hmm. so that's an extreme example and when when we think about evidence-based practice we have this uh, you know we think about um best available evidence we think about patient values and this other thing called clinical experience uh which is it's just sort of left there oh it's your experience and and i just wanted to drill down into that a little bit and i think the easiest way of of, of thinking about that is well most of us drive <laughs> and we've been driving for so you're i don't think of that dissimilar age to me so i started driving in 1991 um i am better than i was then at driving um but what is this thing that's experienced so i've done a basic competency the driving test uh and then i mean certainly for that first month you go from utterly awful to not as awful you know and you do you do get better quite quickly but then it levels off and after five or ten years how good a driver are you i mean you're, you're not you're not a class one rosper police driver you're, you're not a driving instructor. You can't teach it without further training. You're not a stunt driver. You know, you're, you're, you just can drive. And I think what actually comes is confidence. Um, and what's really interesting, and I've lost the reference for this completely, but 80% of people think they're above average drivers. Now, we know that can't be true, but that is a very robust effect. We all think we're better. Than, and that's, that's not difficult to explain. Psychology. So why would we assume that we do a basic competency, let's say our massage or physio or whatever qualification? I would suggest it's not safe to say that experience on top of that is is everything. It's a very it's a very small part of your development. You actually have to be taught, you have to be challenged, you have to be questioned, you have to go through all the stuff that you don't think you need to learn, uh, as my a good friend of mine uh, describes it as, you have to eat your greens. Or sometimes as a she's a lecturer at St Andrews and says you have to hide the greens. <laughs> so um, you have to learn, you know, more anatomy, more pathology, more psychology, more everything. Uh, whereas you know, if we're just picking and choosing our own CPD, separate debate. If we're picking and choosing our own CPD, we choose the things we like. So we still don't get challenged. Do you see what I mean? So I think we're in a little bit of a precarious position now. Uh, so what I've kind of done with my talk was just to take it through a number of levels of error. So first of all, we make terrible perceptual errors. And you can see that very easily with, um, with visual illusions, with optical illusions where you, you see things that aren't there. I think if you got one there, okay, there go. this was, <laughs> so, I mean, we've done things like this when we're, we're a kid, haven't we? So you look at that and go, well, you know, because you've done it before, that these two are the same size. The two orange circles Don't are the same it. size. Sorry. Just spoiled well, it. <laughs> so, <laughs> For those of you listening to the podcast, we got, you have to come along and have a look at this, but yeah, there's like a, a flower with an orange dot in the middle 
and then on the other side there's another orange dot which looks obviously bigger with smaller petals around it but then you get someone like Chris Attenborough who comes along and draws some lines on it and, yeah and or, or you have the, 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 the famous it's I think 18 1889 Muller Lyre illusion which is is the one that we've all seen before which is two arrows mm -hmm. drawn one with the arrowheads going in one with the arrowheads going out and you can't help it. One line looks bigger than the other. And you think, well, why do we care about that? And we go, well, it, of our every perceptual system, be it our you know, auditory, nasal sense, everything is very easily fooled. It's, it's wildly inaccurate. And our experience shapes that perception. So it's an infinite loop. Because if you think about it, all knowledge, experience, understanding, everything and everything comes through your senses <laughs> to your brain, depending on how Cartesian you are, um, and that that shapes your perception. Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. you're in this iterative loop for your whole life, and you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so so we are, we are slaves to it. Now, I didn't go into this before, and I shan't tip me now. Memory is woefully unreliable um you know you can go right back to uh there was great stuff studies in the 1950s in social psychology that were looked at things like eyewitness testimony and it turns out they are absolutely hopeless and there was a great classic study where uh a, a car crash was filmed and participants were asked simply how fast was the car going and all they did in each condition was change the adjective when it crashed, smashed, collided, made contact. And actually, the severity of the word increases the estimate. It, it's that malleable. And then there was a further question, which was, um, was there any glass on the road? There wasn't. But where the word smashed was used, glass was reported to be. In the road. So our perception is woefully unreliable and easily fooled, as is our memory. So those are the first two layers of, of not seeing the world as it is, not remembering it as it is. And again, this is nothing to worry about. If you go to any university, uh, uh, go to the psychology department, ask for the cognitive psychologist, there'll be some weirdos down the end of the corridor. And you go in and say, have we got an accurate perception of the world? And go, no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, how good are we at making rational decisions? We go, just awful. <laughs> We're just terrible at it. So uh, that sort of leads us into something which a lot of people do talk a lot more about now, which is your cognitive biases. I think you might have had a have one of my slides there. Well, I've just listed a few. There you go. Just before we do that, I just want to... Mm. anyone who's thinking okay this is really interesting we're showing kind of like how we can't rely on our memory and we can't rely on what we perceive to be happening and our brain can fool us and that what's the what what are you getting at with regards to like a therapist then in terms of a therapist practice are you kind of suggesting oh, that i'm coming to that i tell you what oh, I've got to put it, I, yeah no, i've got to put it Sorry, all together it. Okay, no. <laughs> no no absolutely fine absolutely fine uh, there's just layers of 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 vulnerability in how okay. we see the world and how we think about it and how we make decisions. So we've just started very, I think it's just illuminating to realize at the most fundamental level, <laughs> our experience of the world is inaccurate. Okay. And it's okay to, it's cool to accept that. It's okay to be wrong. So, it's okay. Psychologists to, yeah. don't lose any sleep over this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely fine with it. Now, Cognitive biases does get talked about quite a lot more, and you do see it referred to um, in a lot of social media. And we have, so I've listed um, sort of seven or eight here. There are something like 200 or so that have been identified experimentally and given a name. And they, they are, in fact, best resource for it is Wikipedia. If you put logical fallacies or cognitive biases into Wikipedia, they're all there. And they're just brilliant. Just pick one and read it because they make sense they're really well written mm -hmm. uh so to pick out a couple uh we can all relate to our own confirmation bias we naturally gravitate to things we agree with we remember the things we agree with when we're out driving we remember that we were great drivers and everyone else was terrible 
we don't even remember our own mistakes, much less process them. So we're completely kind of self-deluding. We stereotype and we all stereotype. And I think if we think we don't stereotype, then we're even more wrong because you honestly can't help it. You assume attributes to a particular group when you're talking to the person in front of you. It's, it's utterly impossible to, to not have that. I mean, you can, whether you're racist on top of that or sexist is something else. Uh, but there's a stereotyping that's inevitable. Uh, the gambler's fallacy. You know, if I flip a coin and I get heads nine times in a row, you swear on your life the next one will be tails. But it's not it's still 50-50. We still think if we keep putting more money in when we've been losing, we'll get it all back. And if that didn't, if that wasn't real, there wouldn't be any gambling. No one would gamble. We would perceive risk. We would perceive probability accurately and go, Right, I'm never gambling. No one would enter the lottery mm -hmm. ever. We because it, it it is such astronomical odds. We can't grasp it, so we do it. And you I do it have occasionally. To be in it, don't you? You have to be in yeah. it. <laughs> That's how it works. Now that now you've hit the yeah. nail there. You've hit the nail beautifully <laughs> because it's it's the appeal to your emotional brain that draws you in. So you can lay out the numbers, and then go. Yeah, but if you don't try, you won't bid it. And that's what sticks in your head. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you know, everything we see on the news is an unusual event. Therefore, it's newsworthy. But we start to think all of the things on the news is the real world. It's not. It's, it's the extreme events. So we're getting a straight, you know, you get a skewed view just inevitably. You know, even, even before you want to discuss any particular bias from any particular organization, there's an inherent bias in the fact you're seeing a new, do you see what I mean? So it's, it's, yeah, definitely. it's that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, I know I've, I've mentioned Paradolia and you would have talked, I, I imagine so, with our, <laughs> our friend uh, Paul Ingram uh, about that. His, uh, we, we see faces in clouds. We can't help it. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, we see shapes in things that aren't really there. We're pattern making machines. We're not, we're not passive brains that just take everything in we actively make sense of the world it's this constant process we can't feel it happening it just is happening so, i did actually bring up an example of this i couldn't find i wasn't quite sure on your slides i'll ask you later on what the telephone box was about but i did find one which i thought was interesting that i'll bring up again if you listen to the podcast and this won't make much sense to you but, do, um, do it pull that one up i'll show you that it, one let me put this on um there we go. That's a, dog, that's a dog's uh, bum. But what can you see in the dog's bum? Oh, excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right, now. Christ, uh, Christ our Lord. I almost feel like for the podcast, we should say no more. Um, yes. You just have to go along to YouTube to watch it. But that would be me. But yeah, what I mean, what can you see in... That's, basically, we're seeing the back of a, like a pug. What, what are you seeing in the back, back of that end pug? Back of a pug. And it's, it's, it's Christ our Lord. It's Christ our Lord, it, isn't it? it? Yeah. It's a, it's a Turin fluffy bum. <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of like summing up, isn't it? Our brain that knows what it could be, goes to a little conveyor belt of possibilities, and and there it is. Jesus Christ comes along. Mm. It's, it's everywhere. And, and now you can't I mean, do it, can you? No, no, you can't. You can't unsee it, and that's really important. No. Um, and actually, the same the same goes for when you hear something. You can't, if you if you understand the language I'm speaking to you now, you can't not hear it. Do you, do you mean you, you, yeah, you yeah, put your hands over your ears? You can't not, and your brain can't not interpret it. But, this is um, one of the things that got me for for this whole idea of palpatory skills, um, and and like sometimes now, I mean, I don't give as much massage now. But one of the things which really kind of made me have to bite my tongue was when the patient said, "Can you feel it stiff? Can you feel it's kind of?" Yeah. And I'm like, no, I can't feel it because I'm not you. I'll ask you if you can feel it, but I'm just yeah. anything I say, I'm making it up. Because I'm conscious that if I'm looking for a tightness where it hurts, I'll feel it. The You'll same as I'm it. seeing Jesus Christ on the back of that pub. You know, it's very <laughs> tricky, isn't it? And once you realise exactly that, right. that you're open to it, then it makes you think, right, I can't rely on that. I can't rely on it. If I think this calf's going to feel a bit tougher because that's the one that's hurting, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to yes. feel tougher. You know? Yes, this is it. Yeah, I mean, so actually, our pattern-making sort of faculty is dialed up to 11 if we're given something that's a bit ambiguous. Mm. So 
So when you look, I mean, the reason you'll see a, a face in the cloud more than anything else is because we actually have a a preference for finding if the brain's going, where's the face, where's the face? We do that from, from when we're babies. Interestingly, there's a dedicated part of the brain for that. And there's a, there's a rare condition called prosopagnosia, uh, where a person with perfectly normal vision cannot identify a human face. They cannot tell one person from another. They can't even tell a picture of their own face. They can see all the parts, but that kind of exquisite sort of expertise where it's put together as oh this is that person they can't do it it's absolutely extraordinary so there is a there is a face faculty if you like so yeah so when we've got ambiguity would you like, so to me it makes perfect sense to say well if you're putting your hands on human meat it's just so much under there we're not really sure what's going on uh, we're going to if we think something's there we're going to find it we're going to our, our hands will make the pattern but it'll happen before we're even conscious of it, it's already done. Yeah. You with me? It's not. It's not a. You're not conscious of it. It's. It's a pre-conscious process. So, and this is kind of why I guess we have problems with interreliability and interreliability when you're with trigger points. I don't want to pick on trigger points, but it's a classic example, isn't it? There's still it no fixed map of these apparent kind of planes and kind of because mm. you get one expert saying where they are, and then another expert will come along, and they won't be able to find the same map. So it kind Absolutely of the right. same person will come back and it'll be different. So it makes it very tricky, isn't it? Which makes me yes. think of things yeah. like paradigma. You can't get rid of it. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to talk just briefly about um, shoulder impingement syndrome, which is an, uh, uh, an example I put in this for a good reason, just because I, I think everyone may well have heard of it. Um, coming from this idea that if we if we uh, abduct the shoulder to a point uh, our humor starts squeezing everything between between the humeral head and the uh, chromium and uh, it's turned out in the last several years that it's not really what happens it's not really the explanation as to why we have pain and it's sort of been renamed as subacromial pain syndrome which is quite a common trend we've been finding in the last 10 years or so is that quite a specific pathology starts to get renamed into something a bit more ambiguous or a bit more non-specific because actually the course isn't that clear you know the 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 the, the data isn't that uh consistent the diagnosis isn't as good as we thought so what's interesting about this case is not about shoulder impingement syndrome itself it's about charles near who uh essentially defined it in 1972 claiming that 95% of uh, of all the cases he'd seen or 95% of shoulder pain was due to uh, a shoulder impingement and he was very uh, meticulous in his record keeping he had something like 30 odd years he was a very well respected surgeon so the the question is why did he get it wrong when he just it had been so careful and uh in fact could we have that do you have that slide i haven't got uh, that slide it doesn't matter so sorry. right i'll talk it through in it well it's a podcast i, I look after one as i get bored with shoulders i'm sorry I, I just, my confirmation bias i didn't even see the slide totally get it totally get it um so it, the reason charles near made this mistake is because of the missing data it's because of the people he didn't see. He saw people who had shoulder pain and he saw what he thought was a compression in the shoulder. OK, so what he didn't see were all the people who had what looked like a compression in the shoulder, but didn't have any pain because they wouldn't come. You don't go to a surgeon if you don't have any pain. He also saw the people who didn't have a compression in the shoulder who had pain. Well, no, no, actually, no, he might have seen some of them, but it's down to him whether he decided it was a compression or not, because then it's difficult, because how long is a piece of string? There's another bias to deal with there. So it's all about the people he didn't see. And that means you can be completely rational, you can be completely honest and genuine, you can make great records, and you'll be completely wrong because you don't know what you're missing. It's actually as simple as that. You don't know what you're missing. So your perception of the world is desperately skewed. And, and a really easy example uh, I like to give to, to explain that is 
several years ago, Darren Brown did a cracking little um, stunt on telly where he took, he had, there, was a, there was a woman at uh, the races, at the horse race, he says, right, he's going to talk her through every race and say, bet on this horse. And each one won. It was a accumulator. So at the end, she'd made a good amount of money. And he shared how he did. I was quite proud of myself because I figured it out. Um, he had about 36 people on the go at once. And he told them all to bet on a different horse. In each case, one has to win. So all you see on the TV program, of course, is just you saw that one line. You saw that. <laughs> you saw all the winners. So you didn't see all the others. So it's a very strong. And he did this other cracking trick, of course, where he did in one shot on camera, flip a coin 10 times and get heads. And he explained the way he did it, which is quite simply, he did it straight for nine hours. It took nine hours of flipping a coin to get 10 heads in a row. So the missing data is the nine hours of footage you didn't yeah, see. Yeah. So it, it's so powerful. Now, this is our day-to-day -day experience. We're missing most of what's going on on the planet. <laughs> most of what's going on around the corner and yet as drivers 80 percent of us think we're better than average so i think we all think we're better than that. i mean that's a known thing anyway we all think we're a bit above average we're all we're all about a seven out of ten <laughs> on most things do you see what i mean it's that um so yeah so when you have the scenario where in fact you know I, do you know what i'm just gonna I'm going to tell you about a cracky little. Um, this is I'm going to tell you about survivorship bias because this is also really important when we're therapists, and it's about who we see, what the outcome is, and what we think about it. Um, and there was there's a cracking story. It is a true story. Uh, planes during World War Two returning to America. Mm -hmm. I think I've got an image for this one. Have you got the one. image? Do yeah, you know this? Oh, you know it, do you, Matt? My dad used to tell it to me as a kid. I don't know why he told a five or six really? year old. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it explains why I'm a bit kind of like That's yeah, spaced brilliant. out. But yeah, I remember him telling yeah. me that. So I was so pleased to see it. But yeah, go ahead. It's amazing. If you I just to give is. people listening to the podcast a little idea, I'm going to put this on big screen because it's such a good story. And I love hearing, even though you know, it was introduced to me from an early age. So we've got a picture here of a plane, like a. Um, with and it's got a load of red dots all over the wings and kind of the front just before the cockpit and it's got a load of red dots over the tail and kind of nothing over the posterior part of it before the tail off the posterior part of the body and then you've got a picture of a guy called abraham wald in a, in a woolen flannel suit so yeah that's what we got here so yeah, yeah. tell us tris what are all these red yes dots? well it, it's it's amazing because the plan was you 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 record every bullet hole on all the planes that returned and you plot them all on one diagram, which is this diagram, which shows you this is where all the planes are getting shot. Okay. How do we up our game? And the answer presented itself as we need to reinforce all the areas where the bullet holes are. And it was actually this chap, Abraham Wald, who was a mathematician, an absolute stroke of genius and said, no, we need to reinforce all the areas that don't have bullet holes in because they're the planes that are not returning. And it is such a wonderful stroke of genius. And it is survivorship bias. So we, the, again, the missing data are the planes that didn't come back. Without knowing about what happened to them, your conclusions are suspect. And in the same way, if you have 10 or 100,000 people within a 10 mile radius of where you work or where you practice of those a very small amount will come and see you or a great deal amount if you if you're particularly uh, thriving uh, so they're coming to you anyway with a with an idea that probably you can help i know some <laughs> turn up and frown and you go okay this is going to be crackerjack but we'll turn up with some expectation that this is perhaps going to work they are handing over money so there's a kind of a sunk cost to go, right, this this needs to at least do something. Now, some come once, you don't see them again. Of those, some will kind of go through the process and will be with you for a while while you kind of manage whatever the injury is. 
of those some will come out in flying colors you lose them on the way and you don't really know what happened to them you don't tend to find out um, and you don't sometimes i mean i had to, <laughs> i saw someone last year who i saw she was one of my first clients i'd seen her seven years earlier and she lives quite close by and i thought ah i wonder if she just didn't like me or wasn't happy but she turned up seven years later said oh no it was fabulous last time you really helped with my leg uh, but it's come back <laughs> so I, I have no idea i'm obviously paranoia i just assume she just didn't like it at all but i have no idea what happened with the people we don't see again and then of those a handful of people will write you a lovely testimonial which is things in uppercase that says i cannot recommend highly enough so knowledgeable and we love it now because this is an emotional connection it's quite effective for sales it's quite effective for getting business but it is also dreadful data it's woefully unreliable data and you've probably all seen so what or something or in any profession that does something and you happen to know they're terrible you still see outstanding reviews so in a way it's it's the bad data that we can't help ourselves with mm -hmm. you with me so so we have to accept that the good things that happen in front of us we're only seeing a sliver of reality we may not remember remembering it that accurately but also we talk i think a little bit more fluently uh, in the last few years about well someone can see you and they've got back pain and you uh, you see them for six to eight weeks well it just so happens that i think it's 81 percent of new back pain resolves itself in two to six weeks so accept the fact that you might just be distracting them while they get better they might just be feeling lovely while they were it's all still valuable but accept the fact that you not don't know you can't know you can't know if it's you you can't know if it's what you said or what you did or anything it's just it's a good process but just hold off from deluding yourself now i had a, a client a few years ago who's my mate's dad and my mate's dad had got a few aches and he had he had a pain right in his intercostals halfway up his ribs he, had, he could put his thumb right on it he would had it for 10 years following a pulmonary embolism and i thought well i don't know what on earth he do with that but while we're here he, you know he was clear now he's long past embolism and i massaged the area while i was doing everything else well it went and he's eternally grateful now the biggest mistake I could make as a therapist is to go, right, I'm the post-embolism pain <laughs> reduction specialist. I've got anecdotal evidence. I know what works because I've seen it with my own eyes. And, uh, and I would be completely deluding myself. I would delude anybody I taught. And I would be deluding every other client that came in. And the delusion starts with me. And that's... Um, Richard Feynman's, isn't it? Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman. Uh, the first rule is not to fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. And this is why. So really, the reason we have to... <laughs> the reason we have to rely on evidence is because we're woefully terrible at re recording what's going on. So we do have to be evidence-informed. And as was in uh, Ragnar Skarsbrook's talk the day before mine... Uh, was if you're not evidence-based, you run the risk of making stuff up. And I'm really trying to take some time to explain why. Not because any particular person is an idiot, <laughs> but we're all desperately fallible just because we're people. And there's a cracking bias called the G.I. Joe fallacy. <laughs> and I, I had to learn about this because we didn't have that growing up. But in America, at the end of the G.I. Joe episode, they would do some moralizing with the kids um, and would finish with the phrase, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Well, the problem is with cognitive biases, knowing doesn't really get you out of the pickle. If, if you think, no, in fact, the, the biggest name in the cognitive bias work is uh, Daniel Kahneman and his work with Amos Versky got them the Nobel Prize 
for what was called behavioral economics. And this is pretty much cognitive biases. It explains why we don't make rational decisions. But what's really interesting is that these are very, we, we, we make these errors in a predictable way. That you, you're, or you're destined to make them. Um, but even Kahneman himself, he's just quite elderly now, he, he's, I've heard him in an interview saying he doesn't feel any the wiser for it. He's a very humble <laughs> uh, academic. He says, no, I'm just, I'm just as dumb as everyone else. I don't, you know, I'm no, no, special, um, no special insight. And I like that. So accept it. So if I draw all that together, yeah, am I all right? I'm still rabbiting on. Am I, no, it's you, fine. I've just any questions? Um, <laughs> Are I'm we all right? Just, I'm glad you said to draw it all together because it's been amazing. But I'm looking forward to draw it all together now. We've got 12 minutes. Draw it all this together. This is it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, draw. yeah. Ha have a point, Tris. It's so important for the <laughs> listener. <laughs> this is the this is the soundbite that'll go out on on TikTok shortly for 60 seconds. Okay. Right. But, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see. And will not convince anybody to change their mind. The problem is, yeah, the problem is, and, and, and you know, I, I have in my talk, I, I, I span this together of a story of a fictional character called Barry, who, who's the sort of person I've met online many times, and I've met in person on many times, who, who says, more or less, fuck off, I know what works, right? And, and we all encounter quite a lot of that, particularly if we're a bit scientifically curious or we're a bit unsure, and we meet with this absolute certainty. And what I think we can say quite comfortably and quite reasonably is that our experience is subject to perceptual errors, cognitive bias, noise, which I haven't gone into today, but that's another cracker, uh, memory errors, and importantly, tons and tons of missing data. So what I want to kind of, I, I find it difficult to say that to Barry, because Barry, like all of us, is actually convinced that our experience is accurate and that we, we've got more comfortable and confident over time. So when we're challenged, it's so sodden difficult. It, 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 it questions who we are. It's, it's, these, are, these, are these are difficult to, to take on. But what I would like to suggest to you is, if you can, life is a little bit easier. And for me, just the one message I, I want to say to, to every therapist is, is just don't take credit for a really good outcome. Just always accept that it might have been you. It might not have been you. It might have been something has changed in their life. It might be systemic stuff with them that you're not aware. Of. It might be a dozen other things. But even with that, there's 100,000 people that haven't come to see you who you haven't seen. You know, we were so lost at sea with this. Just accept. Don't take credit for it because that will feed your ego. That will delude you. You'll get the God hands delusion. You'll think you can fix everything. And the trouble is, this is where really honest, genuine, well-meaning people who really want to help other people get lost. And I think a certain amount of that comes from i probably i would say from the way we're taught it's a little bit uh certainly from my experience it was awfully confident it was awfully um i think simplified uh with a small dose of arrogance i would say that we were you know almost physios bar a little bit which isn't true um so we're almost set up to fall for this trap so we could go, yeah, do that, do the test, do the retest. That was you, it's magic. And you go, well, you know, maybe. And even then, when we see a uh, an improvement, we've got all these contextual factors. Some of it, if, you know, if someone's coming to us and we've got a pleasant, comfortable room, we appear at least professional and clean <laughs> and the room's nice. There's a, there's a dozen other factors. Someone's taking an hour out from their week. There are lots of things that will actually help and facilitate someone feeling somewhat better somewhat more relaxed somewhat anything just accept humbly that we might be playing a small part in that and then you're less likely to delude yourself 
question. How does that, how does that sit? <laughs> I mean, I get it. I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Because mm -hmm. our lot, I mean, our, our lot are just, your, your, your fanboys and girls here are just like freaking out. I don't know if you can see it. Catherine Ryan is <laughs> like, get away flannel. I could listen to Tris all day. He makes so much sense. And, and she would just see you already, I think. Brian Huxley is excellent nice. points um, here, Tris. Um, yeah, oh, I'm no. loving this. I'm interested, Gosh. just devil's advocate. What about, because one of the problems I think with therapists is imposter syndrome. Okay. Yes. So that's really interesting, yes. isn't it? Because it's almost it like it is. But then again, but then again, also you've got the whole Dunning Kruger effect, which is kind of like, and, and the same person can almost flip between the two depending on whether something's worked. Wow, I'm amazing! I'm going to do this for every single person that comes in. This is great. I'm, I'm actually really good. And then if something doesn't mm. work, then or they just wake up, they're like, I'm terrible. I, I've got the skills to do this. How am I going to go to work today? So I'm a bit worried yeah. whether somebody who leans yeah. more towards the imposter syndrome, if how are they going to live with this idea with, yeah, the person I, gets better, but yeah. it's not you. Just recognize that you might have had nothing to do with it. How yes. is that not going to get a bit dark? No, I know I, that it's, it's not meant to be that way, but yeah. No, no. I, I, I've thought about that. I think it's a mm. very, uh, I, 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 that's really an amazing point to bring up. Um, yes, we've all had it. Haven't we? it. It's one of these industries because you are alone with someone in a room <laughs> that really breeds the, you know, and it's such a responsibility that a stranger comes in with a problem and you've got to uh, do everything you can. And, and so, yeah, imposter syndrome is rife uh, among us. Um, I would suggest you get there with humility and, and a sort of an openness rather than I'm going to deal with this with certainties and things that I'm absolutely sure about. If we can have a looser grip of it all, we've actually got more room to move. Does that, I, I'm suddenly hearing myself sounding a bit vague. That's there. nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it's almost that as if the way we get out of imposter syndrome is we do get a bit of Dunning-Kruger effect because that stops us from feeling like really low esteem. We think I'm amazing. So mm. we jump to the extremes when really we should be happier. This is it. It's, it's, it's a, it could have yeah. been me. They're better. Yeah. Fine. I'm going to keep doing what I do and maybe change a few things. Yeah. But, but Matt, we know, no, we, know this from, we, we know this from the Jedi, don't we? That only, um, yeah. only, only the Sith deal in absolutes. <laughs> so if if you are dealing in absolutes, you go right. That's the posture. That's the muscle. That's the stretch. That's that. Then you really are on the path to the dark side. But just mm. pull back and accept. There's just so much more going on that we're not going to know. Uh, but be all right with it. Mm. Just be all right with it. I'm all. I mean, I'm all right with it. Cognitive psychologists are all right with it. No one's, we're not, we don't have existential crises. Um, yeah, but you guys never go out. I mean, that's why. No, I, mean. <laughs> I, I regularly, I've got a mate at Northampton University who, who's actually just, well, he's a psychologist there. Uh, we do this over beer every month. We, mm. we get quite drunk. The two of you, I'm sure the women flock around you. No, no, this, sure. this is, no it's a, it's a, it, yeah, no, they don't. It's, it's a, it's a vagina drying experience <laughs> to, to, to witness. But we get lots of beer in and we talk about we argue about free will and we talk about cognitive biases and we talk about statistics. It's horrific. And last week he said to me, um, do you want to do any teaching? So I've shot myself in the foot and said yes. So I'm teaching for three hours this Thursday on uh, a psychology master's conversion course or something anyway. Uh, that's why I'm a little bit on edge this week. These things, these things happen, don't they? <laughs> you wake up and you think, oh, I'll do it. How am I doing that course? That's the world according to Tris Attenborough. Not <laughs> who the hell is that? But or who the hell are they? <laughs> um, I don't remember eating that. But it's, it's yeah. I mean, I, it feels like we need a part two because I, would love to. I love the idea of people being happy with mm not knowing and being in the middle mm. but it's almost as if human nature is tricky maybe like you say when you're working with one person you're getting paid for it and all these things you mm. to survive it's almost like you've got to celebrate yourself and think i did this this is me and then you get to see the next person it's really tricky to teach people the skills mm. to be in the middle but i get that if you do live in the middle and this is like maybe for a part two then you're going yeah. to start improving the other factors which could have played part like you said maybe it's the comfort maybe it's my look 
So maybe you think, well, next time I'm going to look even more professional. Maybe I'm going to get sort of like some nice lighting or change the music. Have a shave. Maybe. Yeah. Have a shave, something like that. You know, it's like, you know, it's it's by knowing what is maybe not the definite, you start tweaking the things which could be making factors and suddenly getting better results. So but I think we need a part two to, to, once you've accepted this and we're adopting the Tris way of life, how do you kind <laughs> of live with that and celebrate if you're not, you know, if you're not reaching those highs? Yeah. Kind of but it isn't, it, I mean, it, it's how we would want to be anyway. You know, everything that we hold on to and we're certain about tends to usually get us in trouble. When we, you know, when we grow up a bit, we relax, we accept, oh, mm. yeah, actually, it's a bit more complicated than I thought when I was 18 and angry, and I was, and I went right through my 20s, and I just, uh, I was quite, I smoked, and I was, a, had long hair, and I was a bit annoying, and I was very angry about everything, and I was, I was into Jimi Hendrix and Bill Hicks, and more or less nothing else, you know, <laughs> and then you, 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 you sort of get older, and, and you let go of things, you know, it's quite, uh, it gets easier. I had an interesting experience just recently where I was just promoting a new clinic that I'm working at, and they were doing a drop-in free sessions morning. So I I went along and had and and, and ran some free sessions, and there were fifteen minutes. And there weren't many came in, and I gave all of them an hour, and it was no charge, and it did me the world of good because I realised when I took the money out of the equation, I was just I was a little bit better at it. I was I, I I connected better. The pressure was off me. I let it go the way it was going to go, and I've really and I learned something from that. I thought that's done me some good. So there, do you see, so so there is you know yeah, so we've yeah. got the pressure from the money. We've got the pressure to look professional. We've got all our uh, bloody uh, imposter syndrome, um, but we can only tackle it by tackling it. You know the answer to imposter syndrome is not someone telling you certainties. Yeah. It is it's it's you embracing the ambiguity and the uncertainty of it and being comfortable with it i like yeah it's resonated with me the idea of in life we never really celebrate certainties and absolutes they all sound great for a second but without being too much of a downer there's normally a bit of a letdown because normally things aren't that absolute you expect the perfect relationship the perfect marriage the perfect yeah. kids the perfect job no because life doesn't do that <laughs> it's, always good days, it's always typical isn't it so yeah, people yeah. understand that your job and therapy and helping others is helping them and yourself maintain that cyclical thing and accept and that's quite sounds like that's a happy place to be and definitely they're stressful i think the way i kind of had talked to people who are stressed and even though i look after runners mm. the same as you i'm really interested in their stress levels because stress is load and that could be what's stopping their recovery so when I do get angry people who are picking arguments, we, we sometimes, depending on the persons in front of me, talk about logical fallacies. Because if you mm. do create a strawman or you do an ad hominem or you do one of these fallacies, which they're just setting you up to fail because mm. it's just making this argument spiral. If anything, you're losing control because you are just slating the person in front of you or you introduce mm. something that's got nothing to do with it or you're doing an appeal to antiquity or something. So I think it's quite good therapy when people, like you said, go along to Wikipedia, in this case, I think Wikipedia is probably one of the best places because it does just list them all, doesn't it? Mm. You start looking at logical fallacies and start thinking, right, I'm going to try not, because we all use them, I'm going to try not to use that anymore. It does make for a less stressful discussion. Yeah, because I tell you, I, 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 field, I, I, used, it? I used this very helpfully a year or two ago where I, I was mulling over upgrading my phone. And I started reading the reviews for whichever iPhone was the one I was looking at. And then after a, about a week of this, I had just enough insight to realize that I was only reading the positive reviews. Because mm -hmm. what's happened is the amygdala at the back of my head, the front of me is going, well, I'm just going to be logical and I'm going to read the reviews. I'm going to make a rational decision. The amygdala is going, G -g 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 shiny thing. G -g get the <laughs> shiny thing. And what I realized was, oh, hang on. I'm just dicking around. This decision's already done. It's yeah. done. So I just went to the shop and got it. So that's that. I put that to bed. Um, that, that's a beauty don't think for a minute you make rational decisions you make we only make emotional decisions we just we just we retrospectively put rationality to it we say the reason i did that is because xyz it wasn't it was an emotional decision again psychologists know that and are fine with it and mm -hmm. i think we could all be and i do so i'll tell you what i would really like if, if anyone if like the two or three listeners that we get for this 
two or three what are you talking about <laughs> 2660 I'm, I'm, i think last month oh fat, well, well don't yeah, say yeah. that so I, I won't be able to get my words out so i think like terry wogan where you go you've got your listener out there now no you're into the big, the big league now Chris. jesus it is i think this can help but i would love to hear from anyone who would like what would they like to know if anyone's got any, you know, or, or would suggestions or thoughts or ideas about how do I handle, do you see what I mean? I, I'd like mm. to, I can kind of shape this inquiry because I think there's something I can bring across that's helpful, but I've got to do it in the way that everyone can make sense of and can be of value and hopefully bring us, you know, we can hopefully all come up a little bit together. Um, so if anyone wants to get, I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook, it's just my name, Ian obviously then um yeah then please just get in touch because I, I i can shape this to what people think might might be helpful or, or we'll you or gary we'll, if anyone's we'll got any link, ideas yeah. just send it over we'll put a link in the show notes i think if you we'll, we'll catch you before you're too famous and you're traveling around the world going to chicago and kind of like san diego pain mm -hmm. summit stuff like that we don't need you speaking there yet because we'll never get you on shows like this so we'll put like we'll organize a follow-up one and, and we'll put a little link where people can hand in some questions for you and then maybe base the follow-up on these because that'd be really useful oh i'd love to uh, that'd be really cool but yeah it would it is um 903 now let me just have a quick look down the comments um that was Catherine falling on over you that's fine we've had that up already um gary benson says here a useful reflection on imposter syndrome is we often suffer when comparing ourselves to our peers mm. so then we should compare ourselves to our previous self very nice nice very true. nice and um, there's probably a fallacy in there somewhere isn't it comparing yourself to your peers is bound to be one yeah of that. well a friend of mine used to say you don't know it until you know it mm. it's, it's lovely you go well yeah, don't yeah. worry if you didn't know you, well you didn't know it yesterday you know it now it's fine that's right. <laughs> very true. Very true. Uh, Becky Carroll says part two. Yes, please. Of course. Oh, Becky Carroll pleasure. says a great book. A great book that delves into that topic is the oh yeah, the chimp paradox. Fantastic. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice. Good recommendation, Becky. Um, and then Gary Benson, founder of the STA, has said, "I'll be in touch, Tris, uh, Tris, as I do have some ideas." Oh, okay. Well, I, Fantastic. I, he's yeah. I, he, I know he means that, doesn't he? As well. That's good. Oh, got gotcha. you. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it now. Um, that's part of the future now. Science. But listen, mate, it's been really, really interesting. Um, and it Thank definitely you. needs a part two. But I mean, takeaways I've got, and I think you, you brought it really in nicely at the end. I understand that you needed to set the scene for 40 minutes mm. and then, because it does. Otherwise, what's the name of your character? Barry? Barry. Barry? <laughs> yeah, otherwise, Barry's just going to go, no, I know it all. Yeah. So yeah. It's uh, been fascinating. But yeah, like you say, the message, hopefully, that people have got from this is that it's kind of, okay to be in the middle don't look mm. always for absolutes and recognizing that maybe your patients getting better might not be all down to what you think it is because there's loads of things which are mm. confirmation bias and paradelia and all those sort of things and jesus christ's in us is it's all <laughs> you've got to be aware of this aware of this and be less like barry and more like chris now, I'm sure you've got your weaknesses as well. Haven't you? Terrible, you? Ones. <laughs> <Awful>. Terrible ones. Terrible ones. Yeah, Macy, mate, thank you so much. I understand now why the thank presentation you. was so welcome. I think it's a really, you couldn't have done this six or seven years ago. You couldn't have done it. People would have been, huh? Oh, but now right. people are looking for something else, aren't they? There's kind of people understanding now it's not all magic hands. So what is it? Mm. How do I become a better therapist? Um, so, yeah, really exciting. And yeah, I think you're going to yeah. be at the forefront of that. Uh, we do people. need to we do need to shepherd and help a bit with each other uh, oh, we've, sure. got to, we've got to let give each other a bit of slack mm. have a bit of a regroup you know I, I i'm all for a bit of myth busting but it's getting too dominant mm. it's it's lazy cpd if it's all that you know what i mean we, we, we've got to we've got to build each other up thoughtfully mm. so we're not going to yeah. see you on tiktok with your head in front of someone behind going what's this no. about? <laughs> honestly here he is again i hate this guy i don't care he's got no. two kids and trying to put food on the table he's an arsehole you're not gonna do any of that no <laughs> it's just like not some appeal. celebrities we know it's do. not appeal, appeal to me at all no it's really no. good for courses sells them out I'm it's excellent far too sensitive to stick my neck out like that as well <laughs> okay well i'm pleased that's why that's why um i love having you here mate so thank you so much for giving up your time really appreciate thank it you. You, for people listening as well i must mention you People can teach 
people can learn on your courses, aren't you? You work with Mike Grice, who's going to be a guest next week, talking about education. You're one of the oh, tutors. Is he? Yeah, he's coming on next week with some oh. students. Because we're, this has Fabulous. been the introduction, basically, to a, a December focus on education. Oh, um, so you've, fabulous. I think you've set the foundation nicely. You've kind of shown, right, this is stuff we think we know, but we don't. So let's build what we learn on top of that. Let's use that as the foundation mm. now, rather than tell me everything you know, oh, oh, mighty one, because I'm just going to suck it all up and reproduce it. We know that's not, doesn't work. So you're kind of the, 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 what's the juxtaposition of a guru. Oh, right. Saying, oh, it's nice. Yeah. It's much healthier base. So we're going to have Mike on next week to show how he does that. But you, you're starting some new courses next year, are you with Mike for massage? Yes. Well, yeah. Well, well, I think Mike's kind of MO is once he's got really fed up with some aspect of, a, of an industry, he just writes a course from ground up that is every bit the quality he thinks it should be. He just right. yeah. has such integrity uh, and puts such graft into just going, right, I'm not going to argue with everyone. I'm just going to make a really good one. Mm. And, you know, there's a few of us who he's sort of asked to join him, uh, which was uh, incredibly uh, pleasant to be asked. Um, and now a group of us, uh, myself and Matt, are going to be working together. Matt Scars, but we'll be running a course. We don't know where yet, south-ish of England, but there's a few dotted around with some some folks you've mentioned, Leslie and Stevie and Alex. Um, and it's the entry level. It's it's a kind of level, it's a level three entry level sports massage. Really it's been rewritten from the ground up. It's evidence-based. We are we are figuring out how to just intro tiny little aspects of pain science. That's another discussion. Um, but yeah, we just want to let and let's let's get students to graduate that can tell the difference between good CPD and poor CPD. Because I think we're sent out into the world without really knowing. So that's a part of it. So, yeah, really looking forward to cracking into that next year. Amazing. Very exciting. Okay, mate. Brilliant. Right. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, like I say, next week uh, on the show, if you listen to the podcast, we'll be back again next Tuesday. It's always the same. I sound like Vicky Joyce. It's always the same. Um, eight o'clock on a Tuesday um, on the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel. Next week, we're going to be talking to Mike Grice about movement therapy education. Like Tris has kind of said, he really is trying to grab the ball by the horns. And rather than just arguing with everyone, let's make a course that does deal with whatever it is going to be um, in a more evidence-informed way. The week after that, it will be Anna Mar Maria Mazzieri, who a lot of you already knows, be on the show. She spoke at Therapy Expo as well, um, director of the ST School. She's going to be coming here again with some of her students. I want to give these educated providers of education a chance for their students to come on Obviously, there's going to be loads of confirmation bias and stuff, but it will give you guys a chance to hear somebody showing how they give education and maybe make some distinctions between what these people are doing with other courses you've been on or you're looking at getting involved in. So that's my idea for that. And then there, and then that'll be all quiet until Christmas. And then we'll be back in January um, with a focus on... I can't remember. I did have it decided. I asked a few people, but I'm forgetting what it is now. I think it's the hip. I think in January we're doing the hip. Um, so we'll be focusing on the pathologies of the hip, but of course, in the back of my mind, thinking it's not just the hip, it's a human being, and it's not just a human mm. being, it's a human being who lives in an ecosystem with family, relationships, and work. So it's a system we're looking after, but um, we're still calling it focus on the hip because that's a uh, good clickbait, it'll get people uh, downloading it. So you know, that's what it is. What it is. So thanks, Chris, Tris, thanks, Tris. Um, see you soon. Look forward to sorting out a follow up, and thanks for joining us live. Take care, look after each other.